And now Topic No. 1. On November 22, 1963, the nation and the world were shocked and stunned by a horrible news bulletin from Dallas, Texas. If you heard that bulletin, you probably remember exactly what you were doing when you first heard the impossible news. President John F. Kennedy, riding in a motorcade past thousands of friendly onlookers, had been shot. All too soon our worst fears were realized as we were told that our President had been assassinated. In remarkably short order, attention focused on a single suspect named Lee Harvey Oswald, who was promptly round up and jailed. Oswald's background was thoroughly documented in government files and was the type that would normally have subjected him to intense surveillance by the Secret Service during the President's visit to Dallas. And yet the fact that Oswald was an employee of the Texas School Book Depository right on the parade route seemed seemingly escaped attention ahead of time. But immediately after the shooting he was immediately traced, cornered, and arrested. He was very nearly killed in a shootout in a movie theater, but instead shot and killed a police officer there and wound up being taken alive. Oswald's survival, however, was quickly remedied, and on nationwide television no less. Arrangements were made for Oswald to be transferred from the Dallas jail to another location, and TV crews were on hand to cover it. As he was en route from his jail cell to a waiting police car, a man named Jack Ruby, well known to the Dallas police and instantly recognized by them, was permitted to make his way to Oswald's side while still inside the police station. Millions of people watched in utter disbelief as Ruby proceeded to shoot and kill Oswald before their very eyes. Oswald had been protesting over and over that he had been made a patsy, but now he would never get to explain what he meant. Then Ruby himself was the next to go. Tough, rugged, healthy Jack Ruby strangely became ill and soon died while in jail. But Dorothy Kilgallen, the syndicated columnist who was also famous as a panelist on the TV show What's My Line, announced that she was about to blow the case wide open. She said that she had talked with Ruby and was about to publish explosive material he had given her in her next column. By odd coincidence, she never wrote the column, or at least it was never published. Instead, she allegedly died from a mixed dosage of drugs and alcohol, even though she reportedly had no history of using either to any significant extent. Thus began a nightmare of confusion, doubt, frustration, and fear for the American people. Key people with information bearing on President Kennedy's murder died or vanished left and right in the months that followed, defying all laws of chance. The government's official investigation of the assassination was carried out, of course, by the Warren Commission appointed by our new President Lyndon Johnson. The Commission was chaired by the then Chief Justice Earl Warren, but was actually guided to a considerable extent by a senior member of the Commission then Congressman Gerald Ford. Ford's political star rose continuously from then on, and of course he is now our first appointed President. The basic proposal for the 25th Amendment to the United States Constitution, under which both Ford and Nelson Rockefeller acquired their present offices by appointment, was introduced in the Senate only three weeks to the day after President Kennedy was killed almost as if it was ready and waiting. This proposal was introduced on December 13, 1963 by Senator Birch Bayh, who had been put into office by none other than Nelson Rockefeller. After the Warren Commission completed its work, Ford wrote a book strongly defending it. There is now a growing hue and cry to reopen the case. 
But if you think President Ford would ever do it, at least voluntarily, you had better think again. All of this is no doubt familiar to you thanks to the efforts of numerous others who have uncovered and publicized various matters relating to the assassination. But, my friends, firm and clear answers still have not been given to you by anyone, to my knowledge, on two absolutely central questions. Why was John Kennedy killed, and how? Over the years we have been inundated with facts, allegations, and theories through articles, books, radio and television programs, and what have you, yet these most central questions remain unanswered. I think this is why I am being bombarded with questions about the JFK assassination, and I think the time has come for me to tell you what I can about it. First the question of why President Kennedy was killed. During the summer and early fall of 1962, Senator Kenneth Keating of New York embarked on a campaign to alert Americans to the presence of nuclear warhead missiles in Cuba aimed at the defenseless underbelly of the United States. For months he was ignored, scoffed at, and ridiculed by appointed officials in the government. He might just as well have said, quote, the gold is gone from Fort Knox, unquote. Obviously such a thing was too mind-boggling to be true. But after a while President Kennedy became concerned personally that there might really be something to Senator Keating's charges. He decided that in any case they should at least be seriously investigated so that the country's fears could be put to rest if they proved untrue. Such a course of action is nothing more than common sense, and once the President took a personal interest in the matter, it was quickly discovered that Senator Keating's patently ridiculous charges were true. We all know that within a matter of days, with the United States on a worldwide military alert, President Kennedy went on nationwide television to tell Americans about the missiles and to demand that Russia remove them immediately. The Cuban Missile Crisis was upon us. A lot of Monday morning quarterbacking has been done in the years since. Many things have been debated, such as whether or not he was wise in not demanding on-site inspections of Cuba afterwards to guarantee that all the missiles were really gone. But regardless of any of these arguments, John Kennedy's courage in doing what he did was even greater than most Americans realize, for he was not only confronting the Soviet Union in a deadly showdown, but he was also double-crossing the Rockefeller interests who had enabled him to become President in the first instance. By exposing the Cuban Missile buildup and stopping it just short of fully operational status, John Kennedy threw a massive monkey wrench into an attempt to speed up the scheduler, schedule of nuclear blackmail, which is part of the Rockefeller plan for complete control of America in cooperation with their ancestral home, Mother Russia. Thanks to Kennedy's action, an entirely new missile base in the Caribbean would now have to be found and developed to replace Cuba. As I say these words, this job has been accomplished. The Republic of Guyana G -U -Y -A -N -A, a neighbor of Venezuela, has been turned into a complete police state by Forbes Burnham who was put in office for that purpose by David Rockefeller. The Temera Airfield in Guyana, 25 miles outside of Georgetown, bigger than JFK Airport in New York, was prematurely turned back to Guyana in 1965 by President Johnson in obedience to Rockefeller orders, and it is now ringed by offensive nuclear missiles targeted on the Panama Canal and on cities in the United States. 
I have been warning about this situation for more than a year, but to no avail. The removal of the Cuban missiles also meant that Russian military superiority over the United States would have to be achieved by a slower and harder way over a period of years. American military research and development would have to be stalled while Russia went all out to catch up and surpass us. The Vietnamese conflict, into which we were already being dragged for other purposes, could prove the ideal tool for this, causing us to waste our military resources by grinding up massive quantities in war without focusing much on improving military technology. But here, too, Jack Kennedy was getting in the way. Before he was killed, he had already initiated a sequence of events which were to reverse an increasing Vietnamese involvement and extract us from the Indochina combat scene relatively quickly. All of this meant that Jack Kennedy would have to go. He had launched his new frontier with an idealistic view of an ambitious governmental program which had been put together for him by Rockefeller agents for purposes quite different from those he himself envisioned. But he was beginning to see the light about what was really going on, even stating in a broadcast that, quote, Castro was a tool of an international conspiracy." Unquote. Had he been given the chance, he might in time have added up too many things correctly. For his great act of brave patriotism in the Cuban Missile Crisis, President John F. Kennedy thus became a marked man. Agents of the CIA, which has been strictly a tool of the Rockefellers ever since it was started in 1947, arranged a series of possible assassination setups in 1963. As it happened, the one which was actually carried out was the one in Dallas. This brings us to how the assassination was actually carried out. Unfortunately, I know of no delicate way to discuss this aspect of the case, which is critically important. But contrary to the Rockefeller agents who dominate the United States Government today, I remain convinced that the American people are not children, that we all want the truth, can handle it if it is given to us straight, and can sense when it is not being given to us. As you know, the Warren Commission concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in killing President Kennedy. But this conclusion, which has been elaborately and vigorously defended by Gerald Ford, Walter Cronkite, and many other camp followers of the Rockefellers, rests on a premise that is a complete insult to the intelligence of every American. This premise is the so-called single bullet theory. According to this theory, my friends, which was the official judgment of the Warren Commission, a single bullet fired from a barely operable 20-year-old rifle by a poor, repeat poor marksman named Oswald passed through President Kennedy, changed course, went through a car seat, struck Governor John Conley, smashed a rib or two, then smashed his wrist, then injured his leg, leaving behind fragments which Conley still carries in his body today, and then ended up in perfect laboratory specimen condition, completely undamaged except for the ballistic marks used to trace Oswald's gun. This single bullet theory is such nonsense that we would probably throw a mystery novel in the trash in disgust if it contained an episode so silly and amateurish. But this fairy tale was the only way that the Warren Commission could end up with their predetermined conclusion that Oswald acted alone and that we should therefore put the idea of a conspiracy out of our minds. Of course, Oswald was not around 
to tell his side of the story, but never mind. A note was conveniently found which, were, which we were assured Oswald had written explaining that he planned to kill President Kennedy. Well, my friends, that single bullet did not kill President Kennedy, nor did any other sniper's bullet. In fact, technical analysis of the famous Zapruder and Associated films done secretly for me reveals the President was, was murdered by means that were far more reliable than even the best sharpshooters. Before I tell you what did happen, based on my own information, let me review several facts which, to my knowledge, have until now never been explained satisfactory. These facts are gruesome, but they have to be observed and analyzed objectively if the truth is to be known. Fact. Before the fatal shot, President Kennedy had already been hit from behind by a shot which had caused him to lean slightly forward and face downward. Fact: He was then killed by a shot that literally blew the upper rear portion of his head off. Several square inches of skull was blown away. Fact: This fatal shot snapped his head and body violently backward and somewhat upward in his seat. Fact: Debris from President Kennedy's head exploded to the rear, landing all over the left rear deck of the open-top limousine. Kennedy was sitting in the right rear seat. Fact: At the instant of the fatal shot, the Zapruder film shows what appears to be a rush of something, a blast of some sort into Kennedy's face from downward and in front of him from a position within the car. This has never been commented upon, to my knowledge, by TV commentators when the Zapruder film has been telecast. But watch for this blast from within the car. It's there. Fact: The Presidential Limousine in which the assassination occurred was dismantled and destroyed Within 48 hours, this was a grossly illegal destruction of material evidence. Fact: Pathologists and researchers who have recently been admitted to the National Archives report that the remains of President Kennedy's brain, another crucial piece of evidence, is strangely missing, misplaced, gone. Here now is my conclusion. Based on these facts plus technical opinions which have been provided to me confidentially, I challenge the United States Government to prove me wrong. The conspirators left nothing to chance or the vagaries of marksmanship. President Kennedy was killed by a device mounted inside the limousine and fired at him from point-blank rage. The murder weapon was, of course, hidden, mounted inside the seat upholstery in front of the President. Based on the appearance of the blast in the Zapruder film, it's possible that the murder weapon was essentially an extremely sawed-off shotgun hidden in the seat upholstery ahead of him, but it appears much more likely that the blast was produced by what is known as a shaped charge in a special mounting. A shaped charge is a specially configured explosive device which essentially produces a focused explosion, that is, an explosion that mostly aims in one direction instead of going in all directions like a stick of dynamite. A shaped charge in what enables, is what enables a bazooka to blast a Sherman tank out of action and shaped charges come in many sizes, including some small enough to have been hidden easily in the Kennedy limousine. An advantage of the shaped charge from the conspirator's viewpoint is that contrary to a gun or shotgun, it would not produce a bullet or buckshot which might be found by someone in the vicinity 
and cause undesirable questions to be asked. The only problem with the shaped charge would be its noise. Such a bang would tend to attract the attention of others in the car. However, the conspirators knew that Jackie Kennedy would be too distraught and preoccupied with Jack himself after the blast to have such details register, and the driver of the car would also be preoccupied with the urgent business of trying to maneuver out of the ambush. But that still left Governor John Conley riding in the front seat ahead of the President. The sound of the shaped charge could be expected to attract his attention, even if it was muffled and partially lost in the confusion of gunshots from snipers. The possibility existed that Connolly alone might be able to detect that some sort of device had been fired just behind him inside the car. Therefore John Connolly was a specific target in the ambush along with Kennedy. He was not as has often been supposed, merely the victim of a stray bullet, much less the victim of a bullet that had first struck Kennedy as alleged by the Warren Commission. Connolly was potentially the single most dangerous witness to the assassination, so it was imperative that he be incapacitated or killed outright. It did not really matter whether Connolly was killed or just seriously injured so long as his ability to observe events clearly was ruined. This they, of course, accomplished. Thus multiple sharpshooters were firing at the motorcade for several purposes as it passed through Dealey Plaza. First they were to create an ambush environment, a distraction, so that the murder blast from within the car would not be recognized for what it was. Second they were to shoot Governor Conley. Merely as a third priority, they were also to hit the President with a shot or two, just as insurance against any possible malfunction of the murder device mounted in the car. Vice President Lyndon Johnson was not a target at all. Once it is recognized that the murder blast came from within the car, from a position firing slightly upward into Kennedy's face. All of the contorted and forced explanations you have heard uh, up to now about a lot of things ceased to be necessary. The bazooka-like blast very naturally threw him violently backward, inflicted the incredibly massive head wounds that killed him, and threw debris all over the rear deck of the car. Furthermore, it is now all too clear why the conspirators would have wanted such an elaborately rigged car destroyed quickly afterwards, something which could scarcely have been done, by the way, without orders or at least approval from the new President, Lyndon Johnson. It is also obvious why Kennedy's preserved brain has been spirited away from the National Archives. One look at the wounds inflicted by the murder weapon in the car would cause all of the conclusions of the Warren Commission to be thrown in the garbage bin exactly where they belong. With their new puppet Lyndon Johnson in the White House, the Rockefeller plans were once again safe. Indeed, the Rockefellers squeezed every bit of mileage they could out of JFK's death. As already mentioned, the basic outline of the 25th Amendment, cooked up by Nelson Rockefeller years before, was proposed to Congress only three weeks after Kennedy died. Also, seizing on the complete lie that he had been killed by a lonely loony with a cheap gun, a powerful campaign was launched to disarm the American people under the euphemistic banner of gun control. LBJ was used to ramrod massive chunks of the disastrous Rockefeller governmental program through Congress, all the time saying, let's do it for Jack. And the Vietnam War spigot which Kennedy was preparing to turn off was now opened wide by Johnson. The Rockefeller interests were thus served admirably. American technological creativeness was siphoned off to the benefit of Russia. Deep involvement in Indochina helped the Rockefellers to eventually attain control they desired over vast, high-quality oil reserves in that region which rival those of the Middle East and South China Sea, and the Rockefellers who are the biggest munition, munition makers in the world, 
the merchants of death reap tremendous profits at the expense of taxpayers' money and GI's lives and injuries. But some important questions still remain to be answered concerning the murder of President Kennedy. 1. Was the device which was the proximate cause of President Kennedy's death triggered by someone in the limousine or on the limousine or outside it? 2. Who prepared this device for the execution of President Kennedy? 3. Who had control over the limousine immediately prior to its use in Dallas? To generalize is to omit. It is in the details of things where the truth lies. There is no doubt in my mind that a number of persons were involved in the conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. No doubt at all. It took a group of experts to install the death device. It took another group to cause distraction, and it took only one person to trigger the death device, the shaped charge, outside the limousine by remote control through a radio signal. President Nixon once said that only three persons in the United States understood power. One was himself, another was Nelson Rockefeller, the other was John Conley, who was almost eliminated in the Kennedy ambush. We all know that power corrupts and that thieves eventually fall out among themselves. Nixon has been eliminated, and now only Rockefeller and Connolly remain. Which will win the power play to rule us all? Are we reduced to these two power blocks? Are there no other alternatives? Who will remain to use the CIA as his own personal tool? Why not abolish this CIA? this private Super Gestapo agency now controlled by the Rockefeller Brothers themselves. Why not have a Congressional investigation and a Grand Jury investigation by opening the Kennedy assassination to answer these and other questions? I leave it to you, dear listeners. To be aware is to care, and to care is to act.